loud. How do you guys feel about the lights? Good? Sensual? Are people going to have a hard time staying awake? Yeah, we'll try and see what happens. All right, welcome back. So, today we're back at it. We're going to look at some computer code together. We're going to take our first steps into a uh, better understanding of the Java programming language and of some of the basic principles behind writing computer programs, okay? Um, so, I just want to remind you, as you get started with this, this is essentially the functional equivalent of learning a new language. And when you start learning, that's what you're doing, actually. You're, you are figuring out how to write these careful programs that will, that will cause the computer to do what you want. And there's pros and cons when it comes to computer programming from the perspective of learning a new language as a metaphor, right? The pro is that the computer will never get tired of communicating with you. If you're trying to learn French or Spanish or German or Chinese, uh, you know, you get to a point where you need to have someone to talk to. But the person that you talk to may not like talking to you very much because you don't speak very well. So they may get tired of it. Computers, not so much. You can continue to put in buggy programs over and over and over again, and the computer will never, never lose patience with you. However, the con is that it doesn't always provide very useful feedback, okay? So again, the pro is that you can practice as much as you want. The con is that you're gonna have to get good at sort of interpreting some cryptic output from the computer when you don't do things exactly in the way that it was expected. And I mean exactly in the way that it was expected. Now I've had, you know, this, and this, I'm sure some of you will be in this boat where you come in and you missed a problem on one of the homework problems or on a quiz and you come in for help and you sit down with me or with a CA and they look at your submission and there is literally one character wrong. There was like an extra character or a missing character and once you put that in, it works perfectly, okay? Unfortunately, in this discipline, there's no points for getting things one character away. It's still 100% wrong from the perspective of the computer. So let's look at an example. So this is pretty similar to the one that we did on Wednesday. This is Hello World. It's the canonical first example. Some of you started to read coders at some point, you're gonna read about kind of where this example came from, right? The first programming language book that used this. Oh man, we're, we're, we're struggling today with this, are we? Okay, we keep an eye on it. All right, here it is, hello world. So this should work, right? Let's run it, see what happens. All right, so it did not work. Instead, I've got this pretty awful message. Um, computer has told me that there is an error. Uh, it did, was helpful. It told me what line the error was on. Uh, but other than that, I mean, the rest of this down here is just sort of like, oh gosh, who knows? Um, how am I supposed to interpret this? Can anyone see what the problem is? Yeah. Yeah, so in, and we're gonna talk more about this, but in Java, when we have a string, when we have a series of characters that we want to appear in our program, we need to enclose that string in, a, in double quotes. Okay, so I started fine. I have a double quote over here, but you'll see all the way over here at the end of the line, uh, I had a single quote. Now again, if you wrote this in like a, if you submitted a term paper for a class and you had a quote from a book and you did this, do you think the teacher would be like incorrect, zero, right? Like you didn't close, properly close your double quotes. No, like human beings, like we're not like that with each other. The computer is like that, right? So this tiny little mistake that some of you may even have a hard time seeing has basically caused everything to blow up and explode. If we fix it, again, this is a one character change Everything is copacetic again, all right? So this is the kind of thing. Now, as you get better at this, you will start to be able to see things like this, right? So for example, you know, you'll be able to see and the, the color, this is one of the reasons why we encourage you to post code on the forum following our instructions. The colors that are there help. Syntax highlighting, the fact that we change the colors of certain parts of code to indicate certain things is there to help you as a programmer be able to see things like this. So for example, I've been doing this for too long, and so when I look at this, I can immediately see there's a problem over there at the right side of, the, uh, of this line of code because that closing parenthesis and the semicolon shouldn't be right, right? 
Again, a lot of you may not see that. I've had a lot more practice than you have. All right? And practice is really the foundation of how we approach things in this class, okay? I used to, sh you know, we're gonna start today just looking at a couple, like code one line at a time, okay? One line, one statement, and we're gonna puzzle through what's happening and we're gonna talk about what those uh, incantations mean in the Java programming language and what they mean to the computer and a little bit about why we set up things in a particular way, okay? And then as we go throughout the semester, we're gonna work you up slowly, one day at a time, one homework problem at a time, one quiz at a time, one bit of the MP at a time, towards more sophisticated examples. And by the end of the semester, you'll be really stunned by, you know, the, the, the size of the, uh, the snippets of code that you'll be able to, to think about and work with, okay? This is, you know, uh, this is a little bit of apocrypha. I'm not sure this is a, a real story or not, but I think it, it embodies a really nice principle. And this is actually a, an anecdote that was shared by uh, Jeff Atwood, who was one of the uh, programmers that helped build Discourse, which is the forum software that we use. Um, so essentially, I'm not gonna read this whole quote, but the idea here is that there was a ceramics class held somewhere, and the teacher said, okay, you have two options for your grade this semester. One group of you are gonna be graded based on the best piece of work you do. So at the end of the semester, you bring your best pot, your best vase, your best creation forward, and that's, that's how you earn uh, your mark in class. The other group, he said, at the end of the semester, you bring all of your work forward, all of it, every piece, whether it's misshapen, broken, poorly executed, really you know, embarrassing, and we will weigh it. We'll put it on a scale. And how much you've done, literally measured by the mass of the pottery that you've produced, all of it, all the broken stuff, all the ugly stuff, that is what is going to uh, earn you the mark. And it turns out, which group did better? Which group at the end of the semester was not just getting better scores, but producing better work, right? So it turns out that the highest quality work was being done by the people who were on the weight scale because they were doing more. They were encouraged to do more, to not worry about the fact that that thing didn't work, to not worry about, you know, one or two things that you tried didn't work out perfectly, right? It's not the point. The point is to keep going. Keep doing the work day by day. Don't give up. Don't stop, okay? That's how we're going to get there. All right, so for the next class or two, we're going to go over these basic things that computers can do well. We introduce these on Wednesday. These are the sort of the foundations of our practice for the next few classes. We're gonna, we're gonna dig into these and we're gonna see these, how these get expressed in code, all right? And the first two are important, right? Um, we're gonna talk about them together. So math and storing data. And when I say math, I don't wanna scare you. This is basic math, like addition, subtraction, multiplication. We're not talking about like proving the fundamental theorem of calculus or something like that, right? This is uh, arithmetic might be a better word for it, okay? And then, of course, as we're doing that, we want a way to kind of make sure that we remember what the results were from each particular calculation, and so that's involved in this fourth step of, of storing data. Now, obviously, computers have lots of ways to store more sophisticated data. We'll talk about the simple bits to start. Okay, so, fundamental starting point here. How do we store a piece of data in our Java program, okay? This is really bad today. I, I'm, I'm watching. Um, so here are, this is a snippet of code, so we're looking at Java code here. These are three different uh, statements that declare to Java that your program is going to store some data. Before you can actually store different values of that data, you have to tell Java that you're going to do that. And you give it some information about the kind of data that you're going to store, all right? It's time for me to get out the world's brightest laser pointer. At some point in the past, somebody complained that my laser pointer was not bright enough, right? So now I got this thing, which I think might be, yeah, I don't know, I'm gonna try not to shine it at anybody, I'll put somebody in the hospital, but um, the best thing, <laughs> it has like a little key here, so I can like lock it off. Like, that's how dangerous it thinks it is. Um, all right, so let's look at these one by one. So on line two, Okay, this, on the left side of my variable declaration, this is a word in the Java programming language that declares what kind of variable this is. 
okay? And there's only a few of these that we're gonna be talking about at first, and we'll get to the list at the end of the class. But for now, this is a variable that stores a care, a character, one unit of text. So A, Z, zero, dash, the characters, right? One piece of text. On the right side of that declaration, so my left side is care, on the right part of this, C. That's the name. That is for me, the programmer. That's a name that should be meaningful to me. It's something I'm gonna have to remember as I continue to write the rest of my program. So I'm telling Java, I wanna store a piece of character data. And to do that, I'm gonna name that piece of character data C. So later in the program, when I assign a value to C, that value needs to be a character, and I can do that. I can now assign and retrieve values from this variable C. Those values have to be character values, okay? How many people here have programmed in Python before? Okay, uh, this is new if you programmed in Python. Python does not make you do this, and that's kind of terrible about Python, okay? So in Python, you, you don't have to be as explicit about the kind of data that you're working with, okay? Python, it's like I create a variable and then I can assign it an, a number or a string or a truth value or whatever, okay? So at first in Java, you may find this restrictive, but it turns out that this is actually really brilliant because it helps you a lot, and we'll show you how in a minute, okay? So in Java, you not only declare a variable, but you also have to tell Java what kind of data you're gonna store in it. All right, so let's look at the one on line five. Here, I'm declaring a variable that's name is first, so that's the right part of the statement. And the type is int, okay? You'll notice that the syntax highlighting here is helpfully highlighting these types in kind of a reddish color, right? So they stand out a little bit. Int, anybody, you can probably guess what, 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 what I store in an int, integers. Numbers that don't have a decimal component. One, negative one, a thousand, not 10.5, that's not an integer, okay? Finally, on line eight, my third variable is a Boolean value, okay? Boolean uh, is named after Boolean logic. This is a truth value, okay? Um, a truth value can be in one of two states. It's either true or false, right? So there are two values that I can assign to this is set variable, right? So again, the name here that you choose for the variable is entirely up to you. It has nothing, you know, there's no constraints there. But it's really important to choose good variable names and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. The type is really important because if you want to, for example, uh, store information about the temperature and you decide to store it in an int, in a variable that has type int, then you can't store the temperature 5.2 because 5.2 is not an integer. So you do need to think about the types of variables that you use in your Java programs in relation to the kind of data that you're going to be manipulating or storing or working with in that particular program. All right. Um, so there are, Java has rules, you know, to, to make sure that our programs make any sort of sense. Once I declare a particular variable, Java prevents me from changing the type of that variable. By, re by, by redeclaring it. In fact, I can't even redeclare a variable with the same type. So once I've declared a variable named C here on line two, I can't then go ahead and declare it again on line four to store things that have the type int. Or on, I, even this doesn't work, right? I'm sorry, I'm gonna fiddle with the colors on this next time. Those, those are hard to see, but you guys should have the slides in front of you. So um, on line eight, um, you know, the, uh, I can't do that either. Actually, actually, let me pause and say that. So I have, um, one of my pet peeves about, about classes, particularly computer science classes, I go a lot to courses that are taught here and I sit in the back. I can never read what's on the screen, right? And you know, my eyesight isn't like pilot level, but it's not bad, okay? So one of the reasons why we've set up things in this way where I want you here with your laptop and I want it in front of you is because I don't expect you to be able to read all these code examples on the display, okay? I expect you to be looking at them in front of you on your laptop, which is 12 inches away rather than 120 feet and probably has better resolution than this projector. All right. And there are rules about when I can reuse names within my program. We will get to those soon. All right. 
So when you are uh, crafting your program, and I'm not gonna talk about this a lot because we'll come back to it, but choosing good variable names makes your life a lot easier. So you wanna choose names for your variables that describe something about the role that that variable is playing in the program that you're writing, okay? Um, because then later, down, you, you know, you declare a variable, when you're working with it, and when you're trying to read and understand your program, the name of the variable will suggest to you what you were trying to do. So for example, if I have a variable called P, what is P doing in my program, right? Maybe, I just, maybe my intent was that P was supposed to store, again, a temperature value. If I named that variable temperature, then 10 lines later, when I'm writing the next piece of code, I don't have to be like, okay, is it A, B, C, D, E, F, or P that stored the temperature value, right? This is why we use these human readable names. Um, they can be as long as you want, right? This is only limited by your typing ability, right? I actually uh, tend to choose really uh, long variable names, right? So here's an example from uh, one of our old MPs, right? Um, so there's variable, and again, I don't expect you guys to understand this, but you can see some of the variable names that we're using, starting point, maximum, you know, these are variables that suggest to you something about what we're doing with that variable in the program. And this is, you know, so again, this is sort of the right brain part of computer science, right? This is your chance to make your code um, as enjoyable to you as it is to the computer. Right, so my wife has had me start watching these. Does anyone here know Marie Kondo, the uh, the tidying up specialist? So she has this principle that you know things in your life should spark joy. Right, if they don't get rid of them, your code should spark joy. Right, for you, not just the computer. The computer doesn't care. The computer doesn't know if you chose good variable name. It's going to run the program the same way. But when you write good code that makes sense, that's clear and elegant. Uh, you will feel good about yourself, and you will enjoy what you're doing more, right? So that's what you should strive for. I know it's day two, so it's a little early to be talking about this, but that's okay, that's where we're going. Let me point out another uh, syntactic construct that we use in our programs, and this is important, this is why we're doing it early. This is something called a comment, okay? So comments are not interpreted by the Java uh, programming language. They're entirely for you. Comments are ignored by the computer. They're there for you to write anything you want in your program. People use them to keep notes about what they're trying to do. People use them to put in reminders for themselves about you know, what a particular part of the code was doing or maybe something they forgot that they want to come back to later or a description of a particular block of code. Anything you want, right? And as you guys particularly start working on the machine project, which we'll release in a couple of weeks, you'll find that there's a lot of comments in that code, and you will need to read some of them and understand them in order to finish the checkpoints that we're assigning to you. And you also find it very helpful to write your own comments if you have a sense of what's going on. All right, so I talked about the fact that Java, you know, divides the world of data into different types, okay? And in Java, we have eight what are called primitive types. Um, these, so any data that we want to work with in Java, we have to figure out how we can represent it as some combination of these eight primitive types. Sometimes it's just a bunch of them in a row, right? Sometimes it's a mix of different kinds, right? But these are our building blocks in the Java programming language. Again, if you're coming from Python, internally Python has something like this, but as a programmer, you're not as exposed to it because you just, declare a variable and then you just start assigning whatever you want to it. But in Java, when you declare variables, you have to use one of these, um, at least at the beginning, until we start talking about objects, we're gonna use these primitive types, right? So there are eight of them. And you can really break them down into four categories. So Java has four different types that allow you to store and work with integer data. And we'll talk about why there are four in a minute. But, you know, if you look at them, you might get a hint, right? One of them is called short, another is called long, another is called byte, right? So there, but these are four integer types. All of these types can store integer data. And then again, we'll come back to the trade-off between them in a minute. You may have been wondering, can I store things like temperature values that have a decimal point? 
Yes, absolutely. I would be real. This is a really important thing to be able to do. Java has two types that allow you to store floating point numbers. One is called float. The other is called double. And again, we will talk about why there why there are more than one, right? Why not just one? Does this make any sense? Characters. So text is an incredibly important source of data for human beings. We'll come back and talk more about text in a couple of weeks, and we'll do some assignments specifically working with text in Java, because text is such an important uh, piece of human-generated data. A lot of the data the world generates is numerical, but humans you know, generate all this text. I'm generating text right now, right? Some of you are generating text in your Snapchat or whatever right now. Um, and then the eighth one is this true or false value. Okay, so this is so important to our programming that we actually have a special type for it. It's called a Boolean value. Two values, true or false, okay? So this is it. Now it turns out that if you start from just these eight types, you can then go on to represent all kinds of really interesting complex data in the world. Pretty much every type of data that a computer can work with can be represented in Java as a combination of some of these types. All right, and, and again, this is really about working with data, how computers represent data. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about data science right now, right? People have heard about this, you know. I, I just wanna make sure that we're clear about this. You know, not everybody maybe has glommed onto this, but if you're a computer scientist, you are a data scientist. Like data science is like in here and you're out here, right? Computer scientists have always worked with data. It just sort of a little tiring to hear about this. Ooh, suddenly we discovered there's data in the world to work with. Like, computer science has always been about working with and manipulating data, right? You learn how to do this, you're a data scientist, right? You can also do other things, but you can definitely work with data. All right, so now we've looked at how we can declare a variable. When we declare a variable, we're telling Java, we're telling the computer, I want to use this variable in my program. Here's the name, and here's the type of data that that variable is going to store. I can also initialize the variable when I declare it, okay? So on line three, an initialization means setting an initial value for that variable. So what's happening on line three? So the left part looks like what we've seen already. I have a type called float. That's one of my eight primitive types. It stores data that has a decimal point. There's a name for the variable called mine and then what's on the right is new. So this is an assignment. I have the assignment operator, which in uh, Java is a single equal sign. Now, if you're coming from a math background, this is deeply concerning to you because this is not equality. In Java, a single equal sign is not equality, right? I'm not claiming that float mine is equal to point zero, uh, zero point 0.1, right? I'm assigning 0 0.1, that value, that literal value, to mine. So after line three executes, I will have created a new variable in my program called mine. That variable can start floating point data, subject to the limitations of the float type, which we'll talk about in a minute. And its initial value is 0 0.1. You may have also noticed something about Java, which, which uh, does uh, differ from other programming languages, particularly, you know, particularly Python which is that Java is what's called semicolon delimited. So every statement, every sort of sentence in our program in Java has to end with a semicolon, okay? So that's sort of how I tell the computer that I finished one unit of my program. It says, okay, I declare a variable called bind, it's of type float, I assign it 0 0.1, chomp, I'm done. If you forgot a semicolon, Java will complain, right? In Python, you don't need semicolons. There's a bunch of new languages now where you don't need semicolons. Java's not a new language, and you do need semicolons. You'll get used to it. All right, so down here, you'll see another example of, of variable declaration and initialization in a single statement. So now I'm declaring a variable with name, is it snowing? Uh, Boolean is the type that stores either a true or a false value. And I'm assigning it to a literal false value. So this is the case, there are uh, certain words in the Java language that you can't use to declare a vari to, as a variable name. Boolean values have two literals that you can't use for anything else in your code. One is called true, the other is called false. 
This is the values that a Boolean variable can take. And now I've got a long variable down here, and I'm initializing it to some long value. Any questions about this before we go on? I know for some of you guys this is review, for some of you it's brand new. So if it's brand new for you and you're feeling a little lost, your neighbor may have seen something like this before in Python or another language, so feel free to ask, and feel free to ask me. You know, I really, I don't want to go too fast here, right? I know that we have some people that have never seen anything like this before. Yeah? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm gonna come back and talk about that in a minute, right? So, so the question was, how do I choose between the different types of variables? So on some level, the choice between like a decimal point variable and an integer variable has to do with the kind of data that you're storing, right? If you need to work with data that has a decimal point component, it's usually better to use something like a float or a double. If you're working with data that d never has a decimal point, like the number of students in the class, right? Never is fractional as far as I know. Um, you could use an integer value for that, right? Some, well, I'm not gonna get into a long digression. Uh, ask on the forum, though, because it's really, this is an interesting question, right? There are certain values like time values that you would think you would store in a floating point, but we actually store a lot of times in just a really big integer, right? Because like seconds since, you know, if this was like microseconds since 1979, that's enough resolution to time things pretty well. Right? Yeah, that's a great question. Other questions? I'll talk a little bit about the trade-offs between the types in each category in a minute. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah, did you have your hand up? Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, just, just a sec. Yeah, I should have put this earlier. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's run a little example and play with this. So again, when we get to these playground examples, like, you know, we put a lot of time and energy into building the system so you guys could, could follow along and do this. Right, that's kind of the point, right? Uh, if you can, well, see, if my protector goes down, then you'll have to do it because we'll be able to see what I'm doing. All right, so I'm, I'm initializing a double variable here. Um, one of the things that you're gonna see us do a lot in these early examples, and I'm sorry because this is one of those things in Java that's just like a magic spell that we need to cast to get something useful to happen, is system.out.println. What that does is it takes whatever you, uh, this variable is, and it displays it to the console below so that we can see what happened, okay? All right, so first of all, let's try running this all by itself, okay? So this is an interesting thing about Java, right? Uh, if I try to run this without making any changes, Java's gonna, there's an error message, and Java says, X may not have been initialized. So when I declare a variable, if I try to use it right away, Java is not going to run that program because it's gonna tell me, wait, you know, I'm not sure, I don't know what the value, you never told me what the value of X is, right? How am I supposed to print it, right? All right, so I can do this in two different ways. Since I have a double, I can set my double to some type of double value, remember the semicolon. Now when I run this, I get the result that I expect. If I know what the initial value is when I'm declaring the variable, then, I can just do it right as part of the declaration. So this also works. Okay. All right, so one of the things that we just saw in that example is, is an example of something called a literal. Um, a literal, so a variable, the, the names are suggestive. A variable in your program, its value can change over time. As the program runs, you may assign it one value at a certain point, and then you may change the value later. In fact, frequently, we use variables in our programs whose values are changing constantly as the program runs. A literal, on the other hand, is something that appears in your code that's a, like a value, a real value in the world. It's a constant, it doesn't change. And we frequently use literals to assign val initial values to variables. So here's an example of a literal, right? Now, you might be wondering, this looks like a number, except there's an L over there to the right. And in Java, that's how you mark that this is a long literal as opposed to an int literal. This is a number, this is the number 1000. But because I'm assigning it to a value that's of type long, I need to add this uh, character to the end of my number to tell Java that that's what this is. Here's an example of a character literal, okay? 
If you want to have some fun, see what happens if you replace the single quotes with double quotes, okay? Um, but characters we initialize with a single character value in single quotes. Okay? If you use double quotes, it will not work. And then, like I said before, we have two Boolean literals, true and false, that we can use to, uh, to initialize and assign initial values to our data. All right, so literals, you know, again, the, the value g there is never going to change. The variable one can change over time, okay? And again, so the same variable can be assigned different values that are gonna have its value modified as the program runs. And I, want, I, I don't wanna rush through this because we're introduced, actually introducing some new syntax here, so I wanna go through this line by line carefully as we're gonna show you some new operators that we can use to modify the value of the variable. All right, so if we wanna see what's happening here, if you just run this code, it's not gonna show you anything. If you wanna get a sense of what's going on, and again, I always encourage you to do this with all these examples, you put in this magic incantation, system.out.println, and then the name of the variable that you wanna display inside parentheses. So now we can see at that point in my code what the value of that variable is. Now that we're starting to see code that has a few more lines, I think it's worth just briefly pointing out that when the computer executes your code, it starts at the top and it goes line by line, one line after another until it gets to the bottom. There are some exceptions to this we're gonna talk about. There's ways to repeat various parts of your code over and over again, but for now, when I ran this code, here's what Java did. It ignored this comment. It got to line two and it said, okay, the programmer is telling me that they want a, val a variable called changing. It's type int and it's gonna be initialized to the value 10. So when line three starts, changing has the value 10. Or I should say when line two finishes, I have a variable called changing that I can now use in my program to store integer values and it has the value 10. All right, now I get to line three. Now I'm going to change the value of my changing variable. So I have a statement, this is an assignment. It's not a declaration, notice there's no type to the left. I don't need a type because Java already knows what kind of variable this is. So I say I'm gonna set changing equal to 20. So now I've changed the value of changing. So at the end of line three, changing now has the value of 20. Now on line four, I'm telling the computer at that point in the program, print off the value of changing which it does, and that appears down here at the bottom. And then I have three more statements. Okay, so let's go through some of these. So I can do math on the right side of an assignment. So what do you think happens here? So the computer says, okay, there's an assignment here. I'm assigning a new value to changing. What's that value? It evaluates this expression. <coughs> Excuse me. This is math. It's 20 plus 10. So let's move our print statement here, just down a line, and we'll see what the value of changing is at that point in the program, it's 30, okay? All right, so now these are, and, and, and to, you know, look, I'm not gonna lie. To some degree, some of what we do in this class is programming by induction. We show you guys things, we let you experiment with them, and gain some intuition about what's going on. Not always gonna go through every single you know, a bit of syntax and explain it, you know, in gory detail, okay? Partly because a lot of you will be able to guess what these things do, right? Even if you've never programmed before, even if it's like your first day writing some code. What happens on line six, okay? So this is interesting, okay? I have something that looks like an assignment. I have a value on the right, a literal one, but I have this uh, plus equals that I have not seen before. Who wants to guess what that does? Somebody who doesn't actually know. Somebody who's never seen this before. Just take a wild guess, because a bunch of you have seen this before in Python. Yeah. Yeah, plus equals. So I add whatever the current value of changing is, I add one in this case. Okay, so let's move our print statement down a line and see what happens. Okay, okay, so 
Changing was 20, then I modified it to 30, then I added one, let's try adding five. Exactly, okay? Now, what about this guy at the end? So now let's put our, and we can, we can have more than one print statement, so let's just have two now. So I'm gonna cut and paste this into the bottom. <coughs> okay, so now this is weird. So the slash equals does what? Based on our inspection of the program. It seems to, yes? It divides it by whatever the constant is on the right. So in this case, the constant on the right is two, so I divide change it by two. What's weird about this? Yeah. Yeah, 35 divided by two is not 17. 30, but, but what happened here? What, what was, what's the problem, yeah? Yeah, so integers, remember changing, I told Java, changing is gonna store integer values. The result of 35 divided by two, to accurately represent that, I have to have a decimal component, but I can't store one. And so what happens here is the value just gets tossed, okay? One thing I wanna be very careful to make sure you understand, it does not get rounded. There's no rounding that goes on here. Let's choose a different value and maybe we can see a little bit better how this happens, okay? There we go, that's good. 35 divided by three is 11.6. Six, 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 six. That'd be a good way to use the rest of class time, just keep going, but um, the value that's printed is 11. So this is not rounded. What happens is that the decimal components just get ignored. They are discarded just dropped, never to be seen again. Okay, good. Throughout my program, and again, this is important to understand, variables have to maintain their types. So if I tell Java that I'm gonna store integer data, I can't then assign a literal that's a decimal point value to this integer. So if I try to run this, what's gonna happen? I'm essentially going to get a warning this is an error, sorry. My program didn't run. Java is telling me, you told me that you were gonna use changing to store int values. Now you assigned it a floating point value. I can't do that. So this is, you know, remember what I said about Python? This is one of the advantages of using Java, is that the, the computer is going to help you, right? It's gonna help you avoid mistakes like this. In Python, you can do this all day long. Doesn't matter. And when you get to the end of your program, you may have no idea whether changing has a character, a boolean, a long, a double, who knows? In Java, you give, the you give the computer information about what the variable is supposed to do for you, and then it can help make sure that you're using it appropriately. This is actually, again, it turns out, after 20 years of experience doing this and using a bunch of different languages, I have come to appreciate that this is a feature, not a bug. All right. So I can do, I'm gonna pick up a little bit of speed at this point. I can assign, because you guys can play with these later and ask on the form, I can assign and modify the variables um, based on the values of other variables. So here on line one, I create a variable called first of type double and I initialize it to 10.0. On line two, I create a variable called second of type double, I initialize it to 5.0. I can, now, now again, here's one of these places where these math people are like, <laughs> brain is exploding, right? First is equal to second, right? Like in no math world can that possibly be true, right? 10 does not equal five. But that's not what I'm saying. The equal sign is assignment. So what's happening here? I'm taking whatever value is stored in second and I'm, and I'm assigning it to first. I'm not moving the value, I'm copying it. So second still contains 10, five after I do this. So let's verify that by putting in a print statement. So we can make sure that this doesn't modify the value of second. It does modify the value of first. So if I put first here, I'm gonna see that first is going to be 10 beforehand and five afterwards. And I can do all the, the math that I was doing before on the right side of my assignments using variables instead of literals as well. So at the bottom, I'm actually doing some math where I'm saying, okay, I created a a variable called third on line eight, I set it to two, and then I set first is equal to whatever the value is that is stored in second plus whatever value is stored in third, that gets assigned to first. All right. And, and so again, 
what, I mean, may, maybe like computer science is on some level like my attempt to get even with my, my uh, difficult math background. I was really good at math until I got to college, and then I was terrible at math for, forever afterwards. Um, so like stuff like this, right? I mean, the other things was kind of abstract, but this is clearly just wrong, right? How can z be equal to z plus one? But again, this is not a quality. It's assignment. So what am I doing? Z was 10. And this is actually another a little a bit of subtlety here that you guys need to understand, right? So let's walk through exactly what happens when line two of this program gets executed. Line one gets executed, and now I have a variable available to me called z that can store integers, and its value is 10. I start executing line two. You know, here's what happens. When you do assignment, and I know this is weird. I told you that we go top to bottom, but we don't always want to think about our programs as going from left to right. Sometimes we want to read assignment. In fact, I would say all the time. You want to read assignment from right to left. So you start off on the right side of the equal sign. So let's figure out what's going on there, okay? So on the right side of the equal side, I have the expression z plus 1. What's the current value of z? 10. What's 10 plus 1? 11. So now Java knows what the value of this expression is. Now it's going to assign it to z, right? So the way these assignments get computed is that the right part of the assignment is computed, and then it's assigned to whatever is on the left side of the assignment. So when we're modifying the value of a variable that's also used on the right side, this can, at first this can be a little bit confusing, right? You know, it's like, how can I both use and modify z at the same time? The best way to think about this is two separate uh, statements. The first one is figure out what the value on the right side of the equal side is, the second action is assign it to z. So here z is 11 when I'm done. And, and again, I was just, this is just what I was saying. So we really want to read assignment from the right to the left, not from, or, or start with the right side of the equal sign and then move back to the left. So here I have a double called first, a double called second. When I arrive at line four, I start on the right side of the equal sign and I say first, What's the value of first? 10.0. What's the value of second? 5.0. I'm also including a, a literal there, 10.0. Add those all together, and I'm going to end up assigning 25 to first, modifying its value. All right, so let's come back and finish by talking about the primitive types a little bit more, now that we've seen some examples of them in action. So what is it about, what makes the primitive types primitive? There's something that all of these types have in common. And to be honest, if you think about it, so I had four integer types, two floating point types, Boolean, and character. Okay, so clearly there's something that's common about six of them already. What is that? Six of them share something in common. Yeah. They store numbers. Yeah, I mean, what kind of number? Whatever. Who cares? It's a number, right? some rules about how big it can be and whether or not it can have a decimal component, but they're numbers. Okay, what about the other two? Booleans and characters. We're so close. There's something that's true about all of these. So it turns out they can all be represented by the computer as a single number. So Booleans, how do we do Booleans? Zero and one. I just pick arbitrary numbers, and it doesn't have to be 0 and 1. It is 0 and 1. It could be like 10 and 20, 5 and negative 5. Who cares, right? The convention is that it's 0 and 1, right? Um, what about characters, though? So, okay, so Booleans, you guys saw that right away. What about characters, right? How do I represent a character as an int, a number? Check it out. It's the ASCII table. So at some point, in like the 19, I don't know when this was when this invented, somebody came up with this, like in the 50s maybe, maybe even earlier. Um, some people sat down, some early computer scientists, and they were like, let's just make up something. And I'm serious about this. There, there's no like, these didn't come down on stone tablets, right? We didn't receive this as like a message from an alien civilization or something like that. We just made this up. So these are our conventions about the numbers that are assigned to different characters. So if you look at this table, the right 
The left side over here is the value that's actually stored in the computer, all the way up to 127. And on the right side is the character. And you'll see that we can represent A through Z, small characters, and then we've, the numerals are pretty important, a bunch of mathematical operators. Uh, there's a bunch of kind of weird stuff over here that you may guys have never heard of. Uh, like, there's, so B-E-L, does anyone want to guess what that does? That's just sort of amusing. That's what, that will cause your computer to ring a bell. I'm not kidding. Um, anyway, so, so this is our convention, right? So when you store the number S, capital S in the computer, using this convention, the number that's stored is 53, which is over here. Sorry, 83, 83. But this is just a convention that we made up, right? There's no rule, law of the universe that says this is true, okay? Also, what's, what's missing from this? Anything? This is good, like this is good for text. You guys just didn't sit through Anthropology 101, so clearly you're not thinking very clearly. What, what kind of text could we not represent with this list? Nobody here is from another country that uses maybe a different alphabet, uh, maybe a much larger alphabet, right? So actually, one of the things that we've done now, so this is the reason that you can send the poop emoji in your, in your uh, text messages, is that we've actually expanded. There's a new set of rules about mapping between numbers and text, and the new rules are so big that not only do we have the poop emoji, right, which was obviously super important, um, but apparently some Japanese scholars have found Japanese characters in this new Unicode standard that they don't think are real. There's like two of them, right? That they found, they're like, no one even knows what this is, right? But it's in Unicode, so. All right, so now let's, let's, let's close out by talking about kind of why there are these multiple numeric types. So why do I have four ways of storing integers and two ways of storing floating point numbers? So the reason here, and I don't want to bore you with this, it's not really that important right now. Some day you may care about this deeply. Um, they take up different amount of space in your computer's memory. The trade-off is that as you take up more space, you can store more values, okay? So for example, uh, a byte cannot store very much data. So let's do a fun example here. All right, so I told you the computers could do math. This is like my big triumphant, you know, uh, thing that we've discussed today. So let's do some math with the computer. So I have, a, I have a byte value called smallest. I'm initializing that to 10, and then I'm adding 256 to it. So what should the value of smallest be when I print it on line three? You guys can do math, right? Let's see if Java can do math. Nope. Nope. Let's try this. Nope. Yeah, so I, I will let you discover on your own why this is the case, but the, but the fact is that a byte value is so small that it can only store 256 values. So at some point, what happens is Java runs out of values, and then it wraps around and starts with the negative ones and keeps going. So if you want to know more about these data types, including their, um, their limitations, I will lead you to the documentation that Java has on their website. But here, for example, we can see the difference between an int and a long, right? So an int can store two to the 32 values. That's about four billion values, okay? From about positive, negative two billion to about positive two billion. A long can store like many, many more than that. I don't even know what the number is. It's like many, many more times than that, right? So if you have integer data that's really, really large, use a long. Typically in our programs, what we do is we use ints for integer data, and we use doubles for floating point data, and we don't worry about it too much past that. So just as a final analogy to help you kind of think about this as you go into the weekend, um, you know, why do we use types in Java? Types place rules about the containers that we can put data in. So variables are sort of like a container that you can place a value in. The types that Java has set up rules about that. All right, any questions? About this, I'm going to throw up the announcements as we're packing up. Oh, yeah, wait, hold on. This is important. I didn't get there on Wednesday. I'm not going to say a lot about this. It's on the syllabus, but if you cheat in this class, we will find you 
and you will end up with a fair violation and a grade reduction, right? We are very good at this. I don't want you to cheat. I don't want to do any of these this semester. I expect I will, but just, you know, just expect that this is, you know, expect us as anonymous. All right, uh, I'll put up the, oh, please, as you guys are leaving, if you need to talk to me, I will meet you outside in the lobby. I can't spend much time down here at the stage because there's somebody else that needs to come in. Um, have a great weekend. I will see you guys on Monday. There are homework that will continue to come out this weekend. Uh, please ask on the forum if you have any questions.